speaker this hour is Brother Rolf Ruffner. He's going to be speaking on the subject of lasciviousness. He and his wife Janice is here with him. They have four children and nine grandchildren. He preaches for the Hilltown Congregation near Santa Fe, Tennessee. Uh, this congregation is the congregation that takes in the funds for uh, Brother Ruffner, and so we work with him in that work. He's doing an excellent work up there. He is a graduate of Abilene Christian University. And at least there is some things that are good that come came out of Abilene. There's not much good that comes out of there now, but uh, there's a few things that are good. Uh, he's also a graduate of Brown Trail School of Preaching. He is done local work in Arkansas and New Mexico and Texas. He speaks on lectureships and in gospel meetings. And we're glad that he's going he's with us this evening and going to be speaking on this subject of lasciviousness. Well, thank Brother Michael for inviting me to come be with you brethren. I've heard from you brethren for many years. I remember back attending school preaching and first started taking uh, Brother Ira Rice's uh, was it Far East newsletter I believe with the name of it. And this is when I first became aware of the congregation here. And the great work they've done in missions and encouraged people and they surely encouraged me. I want to thank the elders for overseeing my funds this this last year, and I want to thank uh, Sister Mallory for helping dispense those funds every week. Appreciate her very much, and I appreciate all of you very much for your encouragement. Appreciate Brother Tim Kozad too that brought us this rain. As we as this old as we say back in West Texas, New Mexico, that was a that's a toad strangler out there. That'll last you a day or two. So we're thankful for that. And Brother Tim, also, you have to powder your head, but my wife says I need to powder my nose. So, <laughs> way to go. Lasciviousness. Don't hear that word used much anymore. It's not in the vernacular like it may have been years ago. But it's very much in the Word of God. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. It says of God, He delivered righteous lot, sore distressed, by the lascivious life of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing and vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their lawless deeds. Brethren, I believe we can begin to imagine what Lot felt like in Sodom and Gomorrah as he sat at the gates of the city. You know, at one time I, we would say, well, I, we can't really begin to imagine. I think we can begin to imagine a little bit of what Lot felt, he and his family, as they clung to what was left of decency, righteousness in their life among a people that, well, the word alone, Sodom, describes it all. Because the people of Sodom and the cities of the plain, don't forget Gomorrah and all the other cities of the plain, I believe there were five if I remember correctly, they were a deviant depraved people, a lascivious people, that because of their sinful lifestyle, they were destined to fire and brimstone. Their destruction is an example. Their punishment is a warning through the ages. God saying, don't do this. Don't follow their example. What was once that lush plain of Sodom and Gomorrah is now a wasteland where nothing grows, where a salt, vast salt sea, the dead sea, where everything goes in and nothing comes out. All of it should make us cringe at what happens when we flaunt the disobedience of God. Prophet Isaiah in the 8th century B.C. said it well, looking back. 
He said, except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, we should have been like unto Gomorrah. And I hope someday they can't say that of us. You know, we once were considered a virtuous nation. I know that's a stretch because if you read any history at all, we weren't that virtuous through the ages. But today, every form of excess that was once frowned upon is now encouraged and promulgated. And we look out over our land and one biblical word just screams out, at least to me, and that is the word lasciviousness. Our culture, our land has become one of excess. As Brother Tim pointed out, unrampant materialism, unbridled lust, we live in a promiscuous age. All you have to do is look at the television commercials. And you can see even the most innocent children's television. It's there. The sexual innuendo. And then you look at the magazine ads that are geared to the, geared rather to the homosexual community, so-called. The world looks at us, brethren, and they say we are a lascivious nation. Or as was popular a couple of years ago, in your face. That's the world, way the world looks at our culture nowadays. You talk to people from across the sea. They'll say America is a lascivious nation, a nation of excess. We've had two generations of this. Two generations of concentrated lascivious. Now, what does that in, end up with? You end up with a anemic culture, a spiritually starved culture that Lot would know all about because he lived in such a culture. Our nation, if it does not repent, is headed for judgment. As someone once said, if God does not punish our nation, then someday he will have to ask forgiveness of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the, some of the things that we're becoming involved in. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 5, Solomon said, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of sin. He shall die without instruction. In the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Now, what do the vast majority of congregations do about this? Does a preacher get up and condemn sin? Does he condemn social drinking, premarital sex, immodest dress, sexual promiscuity, adulterous marriage? Does he get up and he quote the Bible to people? The answer is no. No. The vast majority of congregations observe the Passover when it comes to these topics. Why? Because they have many people in their very pews that do this. My friend Danny Douglas, whom you know well, about a year and a half ago was preaching in a small congregation, helped, helped them out on Sundays, went out there and worked with them, soon discovered that they had a young woman in the midst who was living with someone, living with her boyfriend, as they used to say, without benefit of clergy. He approached the brethren about this. Let's do something about this. Oh, they hum and hawed around. Well, she's related to so-and-so. You know, hum and hawed. And you know, after a couple of business meetings, and he preached on this, as, as Danny will. And finally, they came around to going and visit her. And of course, she did not repent. And eventually, after much pleading, they withdrew fellowship from her. But you know, I dare say, I've heard of other congregations where it's there and it's not dealt with. It's not dealt with at all. You don't hear sermons about Christian living because that's been deleted from the Gospel. Oh, let's all love one another and hold each other's hands and sing Kumbaya. But let's not talk about morality. Well, Sunday, they and we do not repent, they will hear the judge say, depart from me, 
ye that work iniquity. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. Lasciviousness. What is lasciviousness? It comes from a Greek word. I guess all words in the New Testament come from a Greek word. Most of them do. Which is found nine times in the New Testament. That's Legia. And it's translated as wantonness. Vines defines wantonness as insolent luxury. But in every case, it's tied back to sexual immorality and depravity. The ISBE, that's a fancy way of saying the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. <laughs> ISBE defines it as conduct and character that is unbecoming, indecent, unrestrained, shameless. Others say absence of restraint. William Barclay, I said, I found this the best, probably the best definition. He said, a lascivious person is one who is so far gone in lust and desire that they cease to care what people say or think. That says it all. They don't care. Wayne Jackson said, the word cannot denote several attitude, can denote several attitudes of action. With reference to sexual matters, it embraces the concepts of excess. Unbridled lust, debauchery, sensuality. It suggests a disregard for public decency. And you know, whenever I hear this word, I think back to my eighth grade Bible teacher, Brother Hubert Smith, who was also my science teacher over in, well, later that would be ninth grade in high school. And we would ask him, What's wrong with dancing? And he would say, and I'm not going to get into dancing, Brother Brad, but anyway, he would say, it's lasciviousness. It's a work of the flesh. It's lasciviousness. Really what it comes down to, lasciviousness, is party. As well as dancing. Lewdness, debaucheries. You hear about this all the time nowadays denotes an attitude of sexual and sensual excess. Now this isn't when someone that has a lapse in moral judgment that stumbles. We do stumble. We fall. We repent. We get up. We ask forgiveness. And we go on. No, this is when you have a determined course of action. You're going to sin. You're going to do it. Whatever the Bible may say, you're going to do it. It's lust which supersedes any sense of decency or self-control. When your animal passion takes over rather than restraint, character. The book of Exodus, we read with the children of Israel, we're taking to Mount Sinai, and there God took Moses on the mount for 40 days, 40 nights. Gave him the law. And after that time they began, well, where's Moses? And they persuaded Aaron to make them golden calves out of, out, of, out of gold. He does that. And it says in Exodus 32, verse 6, And they rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings and brought priest's offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now that wasn't ring around the rosy. They were partying. They were engaged in lasciviousness. And what does God say to Moses? Go get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. You can read about the rest of it. What happened after that? In Joel chapter 3, many years later, centuries later, it says, And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. That's lasciviousness too. But where does it come from? Where does this lack of self-control, this moral excess, this extreme behavior come from? Well, as we mentioned, it's a work of the flesh. And you don't have to look very far in our society, very far at all, to find examples of it. As Brother Hardbarger pre preached the other night, examining the the vice-ridden cesspool of Hollywood, the moral wasteland of television, 
the multi-billion dollar pornography industry. Use that word lightly. Industry. That comes to mind. And there's many other purveyors of love, lasciviousness. But where does it really come from? If you put that all aside, that's just a symptom. It comes down to the human heart. A deeper spiritual corruption. Jeremiah said it so well in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. He said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Oh, someone can know it though. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. I give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. Yes, God knows what it is. God knows what lascivious behavior is. We must go to His Word and find out what it is if we don't know. God knows the heart, the corrupted heart. When the Lord was on this earth, the great physician, He recognized that great spiritual truth. That it's the heart, the seat of the emotions, the intellect, that is behind all sin. I love to read the Lord's encounter with the Pharisees. Because they always love to dance around Him and throw these little, little illogical things at Him and He just hit them right back at them. And it was a case when one time in Mark chapter 7 where they had one of their man-made religious traditions that He and His disciples had, had defiled. They had uh, not washed their hands. That's wash, as we say in text. Wash. You know that brother... We're lucky you know how to wash. Anyway, it washed. I'll say that. People in Florida will say wash. Anyway, they did not wash their hands and, and they were called on carpet. And the Lord with His spiritual scalpel just cut right through. And He said, For, for within the heart, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts. What's one of those evil thoughts? Lasciviousness. And He mentions others. All these evil things come from within and defile men. They don't come because of a bad childhood or because you don't make enough money, you don't have a good job. They don't come from any of that. They come from a heart, a corrupt heart. As Albert Barnes said, the heart is a fountain from which all impure streams flow. Now, how does one go from a person, from an innocent mind, that God created in His image, that maybe even had some biblical influence in their life, and how does that one go to a lascivious personality like, for example, Howard Hughes? Well, not Howard Hughes, Hugh Hefner, pardon me. Hugh, another lascivious person, by the way, is Howard Hughes. But Hugh Hefner. You saw the other day, how old is the guy? 80, 85, 90, something like that. Married again for the 15th time, or whatever it was, one of his harlots, he married her. But you know that Hugh Hefner is a direct descendant of the first governor of the Plymouth Colony, a pilgrim, William Bradford. Hard to believe. He was also raised in a very strict religious, I believe, a Methodist home. And yet, how did all be, how did. That innocent child with this religious background, biblical influence, become Hugh Hefner. A depraved, lascivious person. It all started with sin. Romans 3, verse 23. Perhaps his sin, Hefner's sin, was coupled with his rejection of his religious upbringing. That's what happens to many people. They have just enough religion to make them miserable. And they reject all that for the world. And that's what Hefner done. James 1 verse 15 says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And sin begets further sin, as it always does. And it begets this lascivious heart. And eventually you end up with what Paul called a reprobate mind. Here was a man who was a young man who no doubt was bent on rejecting biblical morality. And what does he do? He becomes the editor of Playboy magazine. 
That's nothing new. During the Antediluvian world, Moses wrote, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's how bad it was. That's how bad it can become in each of our lives if we reject the God of the Bible and His Word. You know, during the time in which Paul lived, during in the in the Roman, the Greco-Roman world of the first century A.D., some have said that immorality was as common as breathing during that time. Paul says, even as they refused to have God in their knowledge, God gave them up unto a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. Romans one verse twenty. God gave them up. They had reached the point where God gave them up. That's an interesting phrase. Makes you wonder. Because God didn't, He continued to still love them because during this time is when He sent His Son to this earth for our sins. John 3, verse 16. His great gift. Roy C. Deaver writes of this phrase. He says, They first gave up on God, then God gave them up. Giving them up means simply they were left to themselves to follow their own passions. They were left without the governing and guiding and protecting and restraining influence of God. When men deny God, leaving God out of their thinking, they reach the low, corrupt condition of these Gentiles. God gave them up. Brethren, let's pray every day that God doesn't give up on us. That God doesn't get up, give up on us. Let's not reach that point in our lives. But you know that phrase perfectly describes the spiritual state of lasciviousness. That's what happened to Howard Hughes. That's how God sees Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes gave up on God and God gave up on him. You mean of our friends, neighbors, relatives, co-workers, workers, they are now in that same way. They now are children of disobedience, children of wrath, Ephesians chapter 2. That means they are destined for the fires of hell unless they repent and obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. Now, brethren, I think one of the greatest gifts, and men often talk about the gospel as God's love for man it is. I think the greatest blessing of the gospel is that when we stand before that judge, when we stand before that judge, we will not go to heaven if we will obey the gospel and remain faithful to it. That is the great blessing of the gospel. Great blessing. But the ancient unbelieving Gentiles, they, Paul says, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the way many people are. No hope and without God in the world. What a horrible way to face eternity. What a dark and miserable spot that is spiritually. And we see the tragic outcome of when you look back in the ancient world of the first century. You can see the zenith, if you want to call it that, the tragic outcome of lasciviousness. And what is the, an interesting word you find in the New Testament called banqueting? Banqueting was a drinking feast with carousing. That's, really, that's what Thayer calls it. That's where they consumed large quantities of alcoholic wine, sometimes laced with hallucinogens, and all their inhibitions were lost. Usually this was associated with a feast of the cult of Dionysus or Bacchus. And they would make many toasts to their god. That's how the toast came about. You know, people today you see toast one another. That came from paganism. Toasting the gods. And then when they had eaten and consumed a lot of this, they wanted to continue to do this, so they went in and, and purged themselves in, in the vomitorium and came back and started over again. 
until they dropped. Paul describes it well when he says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. That's Romans 13, verse 13. He said, Don't live that way. Don't live in that with that banqueting, with that lascivious lifestyle you had as Gentiles. Peter goes on and says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. Notice that. The will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. 1 Peter 4, verse 3. That was an awful world back then. And you know, this may have been a great problem. Well, you know it was in the New Testament church. That's why they talk, why they wrote it so much about it. Because there were many Gentile converts in the church, more and more during the first centuries, as Paul and others began to spread the gospel into the world. And they saw this will of the Gentiles. They saw this, these feasts, this banqueting, which was woven into the fabric of society. This may be why Paul and the Holy Spirit told us that one of the qualifications for an elder was not given to wine. 1 Timothy 3, verse 3 and Titus chapter 1, verse 7. That means a teetotaler, by the way. Not given to wine. Not, don't be a banqueter. Don't, just, you've left all that. Don't be lascivious. We can look back and they say, oh, that's fine and good. That's a long time ago. That was 2,000 years ago. Sin doesn't change. Man hasn't changed really much either. But you look today and millions today, they fall into that mantra that says anything goes. Anything goes. You have raves and sex parties and drug abuse, binge drinking, which is extremely popular on a lot of college campuses. They have even gauge campuses now, rank them rather, according to how much they drink. All of that. Haven't gone very far from the first century. Anything goes. You know, brethren, it wasn't too long ago in this country, you could hear preachers, even denominational preachers, boom away on, on drinking and dancing and fornicating. And people now look at that with smirk and humor. Oh, that was a long time ago. Today, you've got to be non-judgmental. You've got to chirp feel-goodism. Wow. The culture is going to hell. You can't do all that. But you know, Apostle Paul, who saw all this, don't you know a man who had been raised as an as a, as a observant Jew, what well, today we would call an ultra-Orthodox Jew, and he had to walk around in that society and, and persuade people to get out of it, don't you know it bothered him? Because he saw that sin begets further sin. And what does it do besides that? It deadens the mind to spiritual reality. Paul, speaking of the vanity of their minds, minds enslaved by lasciviousness, he said, having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Brethren, sin is the soul killer. But it's also the mind and the conscience killer. And you know that's what we're in today. What some have called neo-paganism. Where one is devoid of God and also rationality. Albert Barnes is commenting on these verses that I read earlier. Paul's talking about the vanity of their minds. He said he speaks of a simple and well-known fact. A fact that is seen now as well as then that the understanding becomes darkened by the indulgence of sin. A man who is intemperate has no just views of the government of the appetites. A man who is unchaste has no perception of the loveliness of purity. A man who is avaricious or covetous has no just views of the beauty of benevolence. A man who indulges in low vices will weaken his mental powers and render himself incapable of intellectual effort. 
Indulgence and vice destroys the intellect as well as the body. And unfits a man to appreciate the truth of a proposition in morals or mathematics or the beauty of a poem as well as the truth and the beauty of religion. Nothing is more obvious than that indulgence of sin weakens the mental powers and renders them unfit for high intellectual effort. That's where we are today in our country. People have no knowledge of God and they have a stunted view of morality. All they want to do is pursue pleasure. Call hedonism. This is a cult of lasciviousness. And what does it bring? It brings not only spiritual bankruptcy, but mental and intellectual bankruptcy. You can look at that society. Have you noticed how vicious the tone has gotten in our world, in our country, in the last couple of years? Vicious. One reason may be lasciviousness. See, without the Bible and God, men are hollow, self-serving creatures. In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Well, you may say, well, preacher, all that's fine and good. That's good. We all need to go out and, and form a colony somewhere, and there I'll just cut off everything and you know, just get away from all that. Go off in a cave somewhere. How do we avoid the sin of lasciviousness? First of all, brethren, we realize that lasciviousness is a sin. A deeply addictive sin. Jesus warned against the mire of lust. He says, But I say unto you that whosoever looked on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5, verse 28. He told us that sin is bondage, slavery. John 8, verse 24. And especially the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, verse 19. You know, as Brother McLeish talked about today, there will always be that God-given sexual desire on one hand and temptation to sin on the other hand. It's always there. It's always there. But when you realize that struggle, that it's there, then you come a long way to avoiding that temptation. But another way to overcome all this is we must understand that God is on our side. God is on our side. He has provided the outlet, for example, for human sexuality, and that's through the blessedness of scriptural marriage. Increasingly, in our country, the institution of marriage has grown unpopular. In the city of Nashville, Tennessee, the other day, they did a poll, found out that only 48% of couples, households, were the people married. Only 48%. Many are living together. Many. They don't want to fulfill those sexual desires and the bonds of matrimony. Because the flesh has dominated their life. Lasciviousness has dominated their life. And they are in a worse state than even animals experience. We must also, we have God's Word to guide us out of lasciviousness. Brethren, we have the shield of faith. We have the sword of the Spirit. We can fill our mind with God's Word. Psalm 119. Thy word have I hid in my heart that it might not sin against thee. But too many of us, brethren, don't know the Bible. We talk good things about it, but we don't know it. We must also avoid Satan's devices to draw us into this sin. Joseph did that. Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife, refused to lay her, and he removed himself from Satan's trap. Job controlled his desires and made a covenant with mine eyes. Everyone in the Bible that was faithful to God did that. And brethren, we must also demand of our elders and our preachers that they preach against lasciviousness and promote self-control, temperance. Paul said, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Colossians 3 verse 5. And brethren, finally, 
We must take the example from Courageous Paul. There he was in Caesarea, in prison, been there for two years, and he had chains upon his hands and probably his feet. And he raised them up, and there he, who was he before? But he was before the Roman procurator Antonius Claudius Felix, or as his friends called him, Lucky, if he had any friends. Because he was a lascivious man. He was an ex-slave who had clawed his way to the top of government. He was a slave to lasciviousness. He had seduced his wife, Drusilla, away from her, her uh, husband, King Aziz, when she was 16 years old. She was a great-granddaughter of Herod. And what did Paul preach before this audience? He could have preached, oh, you need to, we need to all hold hands and, and turn down the lights and sing uh, Kumbaya again. <laughs> but he didn't do that. Acts 24, verse 24 said, he preached the faith in Christ. What was the reaction of this lascivious man? Acts 24, verse 25, Paul said he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and, and judgment to come, and Felix trembled. His knees knocked together. And answered, Go thy way for this time, and when I have convenient season, I will call for thee. And we don't believe he ever did. Or neither did Drusilla. Brethren, how desperately all generations, especially our generation, needs to hear and obey the gospel and be free from my sicknesses. But out there may be someone who is in bondage to Satan. If you're not a Christian and you are not have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ in his fullness, you are not free from sin. The Bible tells us God's plan of salvation for those to be free from sin. He said, number one, you need to hear the word, Romans 10, verse 17. You also need to believe that word that Jesus Christ is the way, truth, and life, the Son of God. John 8, verse 24. You must repent of your sins, whatever that may be, lasciviousness, whatever it may be. And you must confess Christ before men. And finally, you must be born again, raised from that watery grave. To walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 38. When you've done that, God is your friend. God is now your God. No longer is self your God. No longer is desire or sex or drugs or whatever it may be, selfishness your, your God. God is your God. Perhaps you are a Christian and you've stumbled. You've wandered away. God has a plan of salvation for you too. Come back. Repent. Be restored. Ask your brethren and your God's forgiveness. And start again. I hope this is not your need tonight. But if it is, please come as we sing. As we stand and sing.